Isn't it great to see our young people go wherever God leads them? You know, maybe it's Niger. Could you even find that on the map? Have you even heard of Niger before this? You had? Of course. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> maybe you had. Maybe you had. Tegan, you remember Tegan in Egypt and, and David as David is planning, David Watts as he's planning to go to Guatemala here in the next few months' time, and we're going to hear more information about that in the coming weeks, I'm sure. Or maybe God has just led our young people to school and to work in Sudbury or the Sioux or other places. And every place God puts us, he puts us for a reason. Every place is a mission field. So uh, we just want, it's just good to see our, our, our young people hear the call of God and do whatever God calls them to do. So God bless you as you have that phone conversation. And uh, may God just give you a real discerning, faith-filled spirit. To be or not to be, that is the, you've heard that too, hey? Those are the words spoken by Hamlet in a play called Hamlet, written by William Shakespeare. If you're like me, those are the only words of Shakespeare you know. Some of you have already figured out Rusty is not a very cultured person when it comes to literature and the arts. That's literally all the Shakespeare I know. To be or not to be, that is the question. Uh, what I didn't know is what the question was. What I didn't know is what the question meant. Uh, so th- that, that one statement is a part of a longer soliloquy. That's, an, that's a word you're never going to hear me say again in a sermon. <laughs> a, is that even the right way of pronouncing that, smart people? Soliloquy? Soliloquy? A soliloquy is when someone t- talks to themselves. So I, I, I sh- guess I should know that word. I do, I do, I do a lot of soliloquying. Um, I don't know if you can use that word as a verb. Anyway, I'm getting off track here. Uh, to be or not to be, that is the question. Part of a, a longer conversation Hamlet has with himself. And, and the context will help us understand what question he's asking. So, so this, is, this is how he goes on. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them, to die, to sleep, no more, and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Does that make perfect sense to you? Maybe not. He's talking about suicide. He's talking about his question to be or not to be is is it better to live and to suffer? And to suffer whatever comes next, to face what is ahead, or is it better just to not be? It's better to die, to end it. And to, when in ending life, end the suffering it comes with life, end the heartaches, the thousand natural shocks. So I didn't know that was his question. Did you? To be or not to be, is it better to live and suffer or to end one's life and to be free of that suffering? So that's the question I'm asking today. It's a question we're going to look at today, specifically regarding physician-assisted suicide. If you saw in your bulletin, I've, I've, you're already aware that uh, what we're going to look at this morning is a Christian response to physician-assisted suicide. We're going to ask the questions, how, how, how do we as Christians understand this issue? Why? Why preach on this? Uh, a, a well-known theologian of the last century, Karl Barth, famously said, the preacher should preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other but I don't have, nobody reads newspapers anymore, so I don't have those, right? The, the, the preacher should preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. In other words, preaching should be relevant. The words of God, God's truth, addresses all the needs and addresses all the concerns of all people of all time. We believe that. And, and so the Bible this morning addresses the needs of our day and our experiences here in Blind River in Canada, 2016. 
When Jesus taught the crowds, he was addressing the needs of their day, the experiences of their day. When Paul wrote letters, whether it was to the Galatians or the Ephesians or the Philippians or the Romans, he was addressing the concerns within that church. He was addressing the concerns those Christians faced in their own communities, maybe unique concerns. And that's why all the letters are a bit different, right? Because people have different needs and different concerns and different experiences in different places and at different times. Uh, so this is one of the, the issues of our place in our time, especially today with what's happening in our nation. And for that reason, I thought I would take a Sunday to address this issue. And beyond that, as, as this is an issue that I've been um, uh, and reading about a little bit over the last little while, two Sundays ago, there was a woman, a visitor in our church, uh, uh, a woman who is a physician here in Ontario, and uh, she let me know after the service that she is retiring in the coming months. She was of that age where she could choose to retire or she could continue practicing. But she was choosing to retire now because new laws that very well may be coming in <clears throat> for physicians would, would, would compel her to violate her conscience in order to follow the law. And so she felt, she, you know, this, for her this wasn't theoretical. So she was making this decision uh, to retire because of this issue. So I just want to take a few minutes to let you know where, where things stand right now, what's going on, and then how do we as Christians think about this, how do we respond to this. What's happening right now? At some point last year, I think it was called the Carter case, the Supreme Court of Canada said that the government of Canada had to... Uh, uh, make exemptions to the law against euthanasia for special and limited situations. And so they, they, they put the ball into the government's court and said, you've got to change the law to allot for some possibility in some situations for people to end their lives with the help of doctors. And so that issue went to a joint parliamentary committee which just in the last few weeks released its recommendations. And I suppose these recommendations go, and at some point in the couple we, uh, next couple weeks, in fact, I think the court gave the Canadian government by June to draft a law that was put to a vote uh, in the parliament. And, and so there's a few weeks where the government can take a look at these recommendations that just have recently been proposed by this committee, and they will have to draft a bill, a law, on this issue. And so I just want to share with you some of the recommendations that came from that parliamentary committee. And um, what they recommended was, was would really make Canada uh, the country with the most permissive laws on this issue in the world. One of the recommendations was that um, a, person did not, a person's illness did not have to be terminal or physical in order uh, to access physician-assisted suicide. All they said is that their Ill illness had to be grievous and irremediable, which I think is, is a word that means you can't remedy it without remedy, okay? So grievous, it didn't necessarily have to be terminal, and it didn't have to be physical. And they left no definition for those two words. It just has to be grievous and irremediable with no definition. And it will be up to doctors to decide what is grievous and irremediable. It's a burden that each individual physician is going to have to carry to make that decision. Uh, because there is no panel that will make these decisions. A person just needs two doctors to independently call something grievous and irremediable for them to be able to end their life with the help of a physician. And so that's kind of conserving. These are very vague terms. What does that mean? Um, there will be no national standards. So it doesn't have to be a terminal illness and it doesn't have to be a physical illness. They recommended that mental illness should be eligible for this as well. So if, if someone has a grievous and irre irremediable mental illness, then they could potentially qualify to have their life ended with the help of a doctor. So that leaves many people in, in rather vulnerable positions who suffer from different mental illnesses and there's no waiting period being recommended for how long a person has to go through this process. So that's, that's one of the recommendations. Another recommendation is that there be no age limit uh, to, to who can access this. Other than that, 
an individual has to be, I mean, obviously, if they're not an adult, they have to be a mature minor, which means as long as a child or a teenager can make their, is competent enough in the eyes of the doctor to make their own decision, then they are uh, eligible for this. So there is, no, there is no firm age limit on this. So children, if viewed as competent to make their own medical decisions, could ask for, to have their life ended. Another recommendation was that uh, doctors be compelled to, re, to, to uh, uh, refer, to either carry out this or to refer to a doctor who will. Um, so there is no room for any doctor, like the one I just mentioned that was here two weeks ago, to say, you know what, this violates my conscience. I mean, I took a Hippocratic oath to do no harm. I got into this not to take life. I got into this to sustain life, to save life, and if necessary, to make pe people feel comfortable in their suffering until they died. I didn't get into this to take somebody's life. But regardless of the doctor's conscience, if, if they feel they can't do the act themselves, they are compelled by law to make a referral to somebody who will do that. Not just doctors, but medical institutions. All, any medical institution that accepts even a dollar from the government will have to, by law, offer this service, whether it's a Catholic hospital, whether it's a Christian hospice organization. There, there's no allowance for anybody to, to, to object to this on conscientious grounds, leaving doctors and institutions in a very difficult position. So, like I say, those are, re those are current recommendations that have been presented to the government, and the government has to take those and make a law in the next couple of weeks, couple of months. Uh, so, that's where things stand as of right now. How are we to think about physician-assisted suicide as, as Christians? Um, this, this is a very emotional issue. This is a difficult issue. People on both sides of this issue are motivated by mercy and compassion. Even just this last week, if, you listen to, if you're one of the five people who listen to CBC Radio 1 in their cars as you drive, uh, and I'm one of those, then on there quite often you've heard conversations about this, call-in shows on this issue. And just on Friday there was one, and the question was, what does it look like to die well? What does it look like to die a good death? And of course, people were motivated by mercy and compassion to give someone the opportunity to assist them to just put an end to their life, to put an end to their suffering. So this, this is a difficult emotional is issue. So, so the first thing that we need to say is it's very easy to speak in theoretical terms about pain and suffering, deep pain and suffering. It's easy to speak in, the in, in theoretical terms, especially about experiences that we have not experienced when we're dealing with people who experience the deepest sorrows, the deepest sufferings, the deepest fears, we, we must only speak from a place of great compassion, great sympathy, great humility. Our Lord Jesus was someone who wept with those who wept, right? He felt their pain and he empathized and he entered into it with them. So in addition to truth here this morning, whatever we find to be true, we, we, must clothe, we must always clothe truth as Christians with love and compassion, always, Re regardless of what the truth might be. And this is one of the reasons Jesus took the, the, uh, the Pharisees to task. Here in Matthew chapter 23, he's addressing the crowds. There must have been some Pharisees, teachers of the law there. And this is what he says in Matthew 23, verse two. He says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. These are the guys who interpret the law. They tell you what God says you gotta do. So kind of like what's maybe happening right now, except back then people actually had to listen. You're punished, right? The teachers of the law and, and, and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. For they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. What Jesus was saying is, hey, these guys are telling you the truth. You, you as, as, as difficult as some of that might be. You know, sometimes God's will, God's laws are hard. The good thing, the right thing, very often is the hard thing, isn't it? 
And, and so Jesus says, they're giving you the truth which feels like a big, heavy backpack on your shoulders. The problem is they're not lifting a finger to help you carry that heavy load. And so we must, uh, what, what Jesus is saying is, is as we stand for the truth, as we speak the truth, um, we recognize that that often is, is a hard thing for people to do the will of God in their lives. And we dare not speak the truth if we do not share in carrying the burden with people. Don't share the truth if you're not willing to help share the burden. And this is what Jesus says. So for us as Christians, whatever it is, whatever it is we we share, we we have to be reminded that we're not just called to share the truth, we're called to share the truth people's burdens to help them carry heavy loads. So that being said, what are some of the truths from from God's word that will help us understand how as we as Christians are to respond to this issue? Uh, So let's just establish what is clear in God's words and in in God's word and that will help us here. The first thing I want to say is that it's Christian conviction that dominates the behavior of a Christian. It's not a nation's laws that dominate our behavior. It's our conviction about God's laws, right? Because the laws of a land, the laws made by man cannot establish morality. They can't establish goodness or truth. They can only reflect it or not. They cannot create it. God is the ultimate law giver. It's God who says what is right. It's God who says what is good. And he is entrusted to the governments on this earth, the ability to make laws and to... Punish evildoers, and he has given authority to governing forces, and they answer to him, but he alone is the ultimate lawgiver. So we are to keep the law of the land, we are to respect the authority of the law of the land as long as we can without violating the law of God. This is why Jesus said when, when someone came to him and tried to trick him, oh Jesus, um, should we pay taxes to Caesar? You know that guy that rode in here with an army and killed some of our ancestors and subjugated us? And they oppress us? Should we pay taxes to him? And you know how it goes, right? He pulls out a coin and he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Jesus says, keep the law. Keep every law unless that law violates the law of God, because there are some things that are God's. And those things that are God's, you must give to God. But give to Caesar, what is Caesar? Give to God, what is God? So Justin Trudeau just released Canada's, you know, their their new budget. Some of us who still have kids at home are going to get a little extra. Woo-hoo! All right. The rest of you are paying for that. Woo-hoo! Doesn't matter. You know, like, ah. That's stupid. That's, why we, that's stupid. Why are we spending money on that? I don't agree with that. You still have to pay your taxes. You still have to pay your taxes. You have to follow the law of the land. It doesn't matter if you think that it's stupid that Bell Canada has, charges you that much for those many channels. I can just share it with my neighbor. That's not fair. We have to pay that much money. I'm going to share it with my neighbor. God says, no. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God. What is God's? So where the law of the land conflicts with the law of God, we as Christians are compelled to obey God. So, so it's that conviction that dominates our behavior. Uh, there is a law that we have both in the Old Testament and the New Testament that we have quite a number of times. In fact, it's in the Ten Commandments. It's the Sixth Commandment. I don't know how many of you are astute enough to know the Sixth Commandment. You shall not murder. You shall not murder. We all have a mental picture of what murder is. Right? If, I, if I say the word murder or murderer, you conjure up a picture of what that is. And, you know, it's, it's, it's someone motivated by anger and greed and hate, taking the life of somebody who doesn't deserve to have their life taken. That's what 
murder looks like. But how does the Bible define murder, what we should not do? Uh, Another statement that we have 19 times in the Bible that stands in place for the word murder is is this. Uh, God defines murder as the shedding of innocent blood. 19 times he says, you shall not shed innocent blood. What is innocent blood? It's the blood of those who do not deserve to have their blood shed. Those who do not deserve to have their life taken. I mean, there were some allowances God gave where where, where you could end somebody's life. There were some allowances where God gave the sword to the state. But outside of those strict allowances, he says, "You you, you must not shed the blood of anybody who is innocent, who doesn't have... Um, who doesn't deserve to die. I mean, that's all pretty straightforward, isn't it? We all agree on that, even people outside these walls here. But what if, the question here this morning is, what if somebody asks to be killed? What if somebody asks to be killed? And there's a term called compassion killing, compassionate killing. Is that murder or is that mercy? Is that murder or is that mercy? In other words, is the will of a person, is the will, in this case of a patient, the determining factor? Is the will of the patient the determining factor? Obviously, the will of a patient is a factor in regards to what treatment they they will or won't receive. I mean, there are times when, when people choose, their will is to reject treatment so that they will die, you know, pulling the plug. And some of you have been in that really hard place. That's got to be a hard place to be. Some of you have been there with a loved one where they've had to make that decision. You've had to accept that. Or maybe you as a family have had to make that decision, right, just to allow death to take its natural course, to remove IVs and to remove feeding tubes and and to, and to allow a person, not to cling to life, not to prolong life, but to accept death, to allow death to come naturally. And there may come a time, there may come a time to stop prolonging life, to allow death to come naturally. For goodness sakes, we don't have to cling to life. We don't need to cling to life. I mean, there are times where, where, where Paul pleaded with God, just, I want to go be with you. I mean, as Christians, that honors God when we don't cling to our life. My life isn't here. My first priority is not to hold on to it. It honors God when Paul says, I'd rather be with you than, than be here. But if I need to be here, if you have a will for me here, then so be it, he says. We don't cling to life. Death, death comes to us all. But of course, that's different than than physician-assisted suicide, which isn't prolonging life or allowing death to come naturally, but actually hastening death. So what I want to suggest this morning is that the will of the patient is not the decisive word in life and death. It cannot be the decisive word. Um, I don't know if... I don't know how many years it was ago. Sue Rodriguez... He had ALS in BC. Do you remember this on the news? This was years ago. And, and she was, I think she was one of those individuals who was fighting for the right to have her life ended with the help of a doctor. And eventually, I think she did pass away without, without getting that right. But um, Sue Rodriguez famously said, whose life is it anyway? And this is the big question. Whose life is my life anyway? Now, she assumed that the answer was, well, of course it's mine. Of course it's mine. And, and, and we live in an age where, where we, we strive for total autonomy over ourselves. But the Bible gives us a different answer to the question, whose life it is, is it anyway? It gives us the answer, God. Whose life is my life anyway? Well, the answer is it's God's life. I belong to God, and so... You have, you have statements um, like this, which, which, which show that it's God who gives life, it's God who takes life away, it's God who has the right to life. 
1 Timothy 6.13, in the sight of God, who gives life to everyone, God is the life giver, Deuteronomy 32.39, see now, this is God speaking, see now that I myself am he, there is no God besides me, I put to death and I bring to life, I have wounded and I heal and no one can deliver out of my hand, I bring death and I give life, I wound and I heal uh, 1 Samuel 2, 6, the Lord brings death and the Lord makes alive. He brings down to the grave and he raises up. James chapter 4, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we're going to go to this city, that city, we're going to spend time there, we're going to make money. Why, you don't even know what tomorrow holds. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a while and then it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live. If it is the Lord's will, we will live. And so all those verses and, and many more just remind us that human life belongs to God. It is the gift of God. God owns it. And God may do with it what he pleases. And sometimes this is very hard for us to accept. For Deb back there, this is hard to accept. This is one of those heavy, heavy hard things. God may do with life as he pleases. He may, may take it at any time without wronging anyone. God gives life and God takes away, as we sang this morning, blessed be the name of the Lord. This is God's unique prerogative, his unique prerogative, his alone. And so you have this statement. I, I preached on this a uh, number of months ago. I'm sure you remember it well. First uh, Corinthians 6, you are not your own, you are bought with a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. You are not your own, you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 14, verse 7 through 9, for we do not live to ourselves alone and we do not die to ourselves alone. If we live, we live to the Lord and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. And so he says there, if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord, but we do not belong to ourselves. Either way, we are the Lord's. My life is not my own. It belongs to God and God alone. Because we are stewards, stewards of our life. God is the owner. And so, so, so death is not a human right. Death is God's right. Death is God's right. And this is, this is the trouble. Even though people are motivated with mercy and compassion, this is, the, this is the trouble with this. It takes something that really only belongs to God and it takes it out of his hands and it puts it into the hands of man because physician-assisted suicide, it's role reversal with God. It's role reversal. We must not grasp that that belongs to God alone, even if it seems hard. For it's not us, up to us to determine what life is worth living and what life is not worth living. Life and death are, are, are by God's appointment alone. So that's a truth from, from God's word. It's true that human suffering can at times be horrible beyond words. What do I know about pain, suffering? I stubbed my toe once. I had this bone broken, grade seven. Got body checked into a locker by a big guy named Gary. Found out I have a very low pain threshold. I passed out just like that, flat on the floor. So that's good. My, my body doesn't tolerate a lot of pain before it just blacks out. What do I know about human suffering? I know that I, I don't know much. I can only imagine that, that human suffering can at times be horrible beyond words. Both the mental suffering and the physical suffering and, and I know that it is right and loving for, for doctors and, and for us to, to, to use whatever means we can to alleviate suffering, to lessen 
that heavy load, that pain. But suffering is not the worst thing. This is what the Bible says over and over again, that suffering is not the worst thing. The Bible often describes how God uses it for good and wise and loving purposes. It, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he actually says, there was a time we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, far beyond so that we despised of life itself, or we despaired of life itself. We just wanted to die, be done with this. We felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but that we might rely on God who raises the dead. And later on in that letter, he talks about his suffering throughout the Second Corinthians. He, he talks about a time where three times he pleaded with the Lord to take away this thorn in the flesh. We don't know what this thorn was, but it, 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 it was so difficult, this suffering, that he begged God to take it away from him. And three times God says, no, no. God said, my, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul said, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I will even delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I, am street, when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong, he says. And in chapter 4, he says, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. What he says is, I suffered to such a degree that I despaired of life itself. I just wanted it to end. I begged God on multiple occasions, end this, end this, end this. It's okay to do that. It's okay to pray that for yourself. It's okay to pray that for a loved one. Oh, Lord, Lord, just end it. But this is what he says. He says, he says, even though outwardly, physically, and wasting away, we are renewed day by day. For these troubles, he calls light and momentary. How, how can he call that sort of suffer, that suffering he just described? How can, can he call that light and momentary trouble? Well, the only way he can call that light and momentary is in comparison to the glory, to the glory that is coming, the eternal glory that will far, far outweigh all the sum total of all the pain and suffering that anybody could experience. He says, in comparison to the weight of that glory, all suffering is but just light and momentary. So suffering is not the worst thing. And suffering in our final days, at any point, but certainly in our final days where you think there's no point to this anymore, there's no point to this anymore, it's not meaningless. It's not meaningless. As, there, as, if, as if there was nothing left to learn, nothing left to experience of God, nothing left to receive, or nothing left to give by being used of God. No suffering is meaningless. And so it's an error. It's an error to say that because I can't see any purpose in this I can't see any purpose in my future. It's an error to say because I can't see it, there, there can't be any. That's an error. God wants us to obey him even if we can't see all the good fruit that will come from obeying him. Our lives exist so that in doing God's will, we might enjoy him fully and eternally. So all that to say that, that, that suffering never becomes According to God's word, suffering never becomes such an evil or such a hardship that it justifies disobedience to the command of God, that it justifies taking what, that right which belongs to God alone. Our first aim as human beings is not to stay alive and our first aim is not to avoid suffering and to be comfortable. Our first aim is to Trust in God and do his will and enjoy him fully by doing that. So the, you take all those truths together and it leads, leads me anyway to this conclusion that, that no person has the right to help someone take their own life. 
No person has that right, motivated by mercy or compassion or whatever. No person has the right to help somebody take their own life. We can beg God to take it. But only he gives life and only he can take life away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So, so to be or not to be, that is the question. So the answer to that question is to be. To be until God decides we be not. So what? So what? For us. Um, we need to add our voice to the discourse, to the conversation. There's, there's a website in your bulletin there. If you look in your bulletin, you can find it. And if you want more resources, information, you can go there. If you want to find a sample letter that you can take and adjust and send to your MP, somebody else, you can do that. You can find that on your website. So you can add your voice to, to the conversation, be heard. You can help in palliative care. This is one of the sad things about this whole issue. We have a country where palliative care is in shambles and people are in the difficult position where they have to choose. Do I either be a burden, feel like I'm a burden to the system, be a burden to my family, or choose death? That's an awful place to be. There has to be a better way to care for people, to help people die well, to help carry that heavy load. Every so often, our hospital, maybe Annette knows more about this, our hospital runs training for palliative care. Not anymore? They cut it out. Okay. They cut it out totally. About three years ago. I remember taking that training a few years ago. Well, there you go. It's just um, they, don't, they don't have that anymore. Okay. Well, this is the sad thing. People will, will be in a position where they feel they have no choice but to take this option. They have volunteers. All right. Um, so, Volunteer, how, how, how can you help people carry the heavy load of suffering? I mean, on this issue or in any issue, right? Our compassion for people who are sick and suffer should cause us, should move us. It should cause us to go to people in their suffering to strengthen them as they carry this heavy, cumbersome load to go and, and use our hands to help lift, to bring hope and to bring love. This is what, this is what Jesus said in, in, in Matthew chapter 25, <clears throat> he said, I was sick and you looked after me. Right? Jesus, when did we see you sick and look after you? Like, well, what you did to the least of these you did to me. I was sick and you looked after me. I needed help, I needed compassion, I needed strength, and you came and you strengthened me. So we, we can't ask people to accept heavy burdens without helping them carry those burdens. That's the ministry of Jesus. That's the ministry of Jesus. Jesus saw our suffering. Much of that suffering self-imposed by ourselves, imposed on ourselves through our sin, through bad decisions. He saw all that suffering. And God had compassion on us. And this morning, God has compassion on us. And it wasn't the compassion that led him to put us out of our misery. He could have, right? I mean, you've had a dog. I had a dog, Toffee. Poor guy. Cancer, lumps. My mom took him to the hospital. The vet had him put down. Put, put him out of his misery. Let him go to doggy heaven. Jesus saw our suffering and he had compassion not to put us out of our misery, but this is the great thing, to take all of our misery on himself, to bear our misery. And that's what this table represents, just kind of segueing to, to the table. That's what this cup and that's what this bread represent, that, that God in his compassion came and comes today in our suffering and he bore all our misery on the cross. Remember that? He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
Father, this weight, this heavy load, if there's any other way, take, take this cup of wrath, this cup of misery away from me. And God said, there's no other way. Either you take it or they, or they have it. And Jesus said, I love them enough. Father, your will be done. I will accept this great weight. I will accept this great burden. I will take all of their misery and all of their suffering and I will take it on my shoulders. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. So that, not, not so that we don't suffer in this life, because we do, of course. Not so that we, we don't face hard things, but so that when we do suffer, so that when we do face hard things, we have a certain knowledge. For those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ, we have a certain knowledge and a certain hope that because of the cross of Jesus, because of his shed blood, that we have peace with God. That we know that we have peace with God. That we know that our future is secure. No matter what comes our way, our future is secure. And that we might know this morning that whatever we're going through, whatever pain or whatever suffering, none of it is without purpose. None of it is without purpose. For we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So as we take this cup and this bread and we're reminded of the cross and what it means, let, let us just be reminded and rejoice again that Jesus has taken all of our misery and all our sufferings so that we might have the presence of God in them all. And we might have an eternal glory that far outweighs them all.